this following video, I'd like to share with you my understanding of the limitations that come up when we are considering performing a phaco emulsification in a patient with an associated corneal opacity. I think it's fairly obvious to all of us now that in order to perform a safe and uneventful phaco emulsification, we need adequate visibility. Now, once you have a corneal opacity, you are likely to have some limitations during the phaco emulsification procedure. We need to remain mindful of the fact that depending on the size and the location of the corneal opacity, it's likely to cause significant visual obscurations during the phaco emulsification procedure. Here are a few tips, tricks, and largely the principles that I follow when I manage a patient with a corneal opacity and a cataract. So here's a patient who presented to us with a soft cataract but also had an associated central to paracentral corneal opacity. Now visualizing the same corneal opacity once the cataract is out under a high magnification you can actually see that you have a significant corneal opacity involving the nasal half of the pupil and the associated nasal cornea. Let's now get to the video tutorial of the surgery. Now in a case like this, whilst making the incisions, one can consider moving the incisions around so as to take advantage of the clear cornea so that whenever you're performing the steps of phaco emulsification, you have maximum visibility during this case. It is important to take adequate time to allow for a proper staining of the anterior capsule. This aids visibility while performing the capsular exes. We need to ensure that you have a good illumination, a high magnification and a perfect focus on the anterior capsule prior to performing the capsular rexes. Now because I'm going to lose sight of the rexes edge as I advance towards and under the corneal opacity, I like to perform this step with the help of an intraocular forceps. The most important trick here is that when you get hold of your capsule, do not let go of it when you are under the corneal opacity. So what you do now is, despite not having any visibility, but having held on to the capsule, you now move your hand in a manner you know which should bring the rexus around to that point where you actually have visibility, after which you complete the rexus in a normal fashion. The next step that I perform is the hydrodissection after removal of some viscoelastic. Now in this case you can see on the left side you can see the wave but on the right side it's going to be quite challenging to be able to visualize the wave. So what you have to go by is seeing the nucleus rise and by the overall rotatability of the nucleus which should confirm that the hydrodissection is complete. We now proceed with the nucleus management. We obviously work under low flow settings so I tend to reduce the flow rate a bit to just give me that little added control. Now normally I would perform a direct chop, but should I choose to do a direct chop here, I would probably be unable to see the direct chop actually happening and so I choose to perform a stop and chop instead. I'm able to split the nucleus into two heminuclei now, once I've done this, I turn the nucleus around and start to chop the individual heminuclei into smaller fragments. Please note how I create the chop slightly on the left, where I actually have visibility just beyond the corneal opacity. So this is a very important principle I follow. When it comes to nucleus management and irrigation aspiration, I try and perform as much as I can under direct visualization in the clearer part of the cornea. Sometimes, it might even help just to merely rotate the eye with a view of enhancing visibility. Having understood this, in this case, if I were to rotate the eye or pull the eye with the second instrument towards the right, I'd be able to see a little more under the corneal opacity. In this part of the video, you will watch how I perform the emulsification of the individual fragments. Please note, as I explained earlier, how I take advantage of the clear area of the cornea and try and perform most of my steps there under direct visualization. 
What you see now is me performing a viscofluid exchange prior to the emulsification of the last two fragments. I'd like you to note that when I complete the nucleus emulsification, when I have a significant red glow coming from behind, how much more obvious the corneal opacity actually becomes. We now move to the irrigation aspiration. I prefer the bimanual irrigation aspiration technique of removal of the cortex. It allows me with significant ease and actually makes it possible, even in a challenging case like this, to be able to completely remove the circumferential cortex with the mere swapping of the instruments. Now sometimes, should you not be able to see clearly under the corneal opacity and not be able to remove that part of the cortex that underlies the corneal opacity, I think it would be fair to consider implanting the IOL and then going with the support of the IOL to remove the cortex later. In this case, however, you will note how I'm able to actually go deep to the cortex, hold on to the cortex, pull into the center, notice that I've pulled onto the cortex and complete the aspiration of the cortex in the clear zone under direct visualization. Upon the completion of the irrigation aspiration, I perform a hydro implantation of the monofocal IOL in the bag. We need to ensure that the entire IOL is within the capsular bag. This is because the limited visibility as a result of the corneal opacity might make it slightly difficult to see where the leading haptic is going. So I feel that if we ensure that the leading haptic has gone in the bag and then implant the rest of the optic and the trailing haptic, it is almost certain to go within the capsular bag itself. We come to the end of the case by performing a good stromal hydration. Thank you.